Thank you very much. It's a, a, a very special pleasure to be here and to see a lot of <clears throat> very nice people in the Boulder political community. Uh, the, 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 the title of the talk, he drew a blank. He had it quite correctly over there, and then he just uh, blacked out, I guess. Is, is super patriotism, real patriotism, and the importance of being number one. Well, as a guest on radio talk shows, I have on a number of occasions criticized U.S. foreign policy. And one time an irate caller called in and he said to me, uh, do you love your country? And the question was obviously rhetorical um, because what, here was someone who saw fit to question my patriotism because I was questioning the policies of our leaders. It's really strange when you think about it. The caller was manifesting a symptom of what might be called super patriotism, also sometimes called stupor patriotism, also called pseudo patriotism, a phenomenon best defined as the willingness to follow our leaders uncritically in all their dealings with other nations, especially when those dealings are confrontational and belligerent and they involve a question of national pride or the use of military force. That's the definition of super patriotism. This super patriotism or American chauvinism has been with us throughout much of our history. And whether or not it's the, the last refuge of scoundrels, as Dr. Johnson would say, it certainly is a very effective instrument in, in discouraging and discrediting critical public discourse. Well, I think it's time that the super patriots account for their brand of patriotism and has explained to us what it's all about. Um, for instance, what do they mean when they say, they love their country. What do they mean by country? You know, academia is not totally without certain virtues. You learn to ask a lot of trivial, detailed questions in any case. So I asked myself, what do you mean by country? Do they, they love every region and locale in the United States? Well, obviously, very few of us have been to every region and locale. Um, and nor would all of us find all the regions and locales all that lovable. Uh, does love of country mean loving the American people? Well, again, even the most gregarious among us have met only a relatively small portion of the American people. And I would bet that the super patriots don't particularly love whole sectors of the American public, especially the more bigoted super patriots, in fact, rather dislike to associate with or, or, or have any positive identification with certain people because of reasons of ethnicity, religion, race, and class. <clears throat> Do super patriots love America for its history and culture? Again, I'm, I'm really skeptical of that because it's my impression that they, uh, that they uh, know very little about American history and culture, or rather, much of it is rather unappreciated by them. Furthermore, there's a terrible side to our history that's really not all that lovable. For instance, the extermination of American Native Indian nations, um, Native American Indian nations, um, the, the uh, enslavement of African people, the aggressive wars against Vietnam, uh, Mexico, Canada. We lost a thousand men on one attack on Canada. I just learned a little while ago. Uh, Central America, the Philippines, and elsewhere. Nor, nor might we all be that enamored with certain aspects of American culture, certainly not the mind abuse of primetime television, the commercialism, the corporate greed, the ecological devastation, the uh, <clears throat> economic and racial injustice. If I'm being asked to prove my patriotism by loving American popular culture, then uh, I might fail the test, I guess. Well, the America that the super patriots claim to love is neither a geographical totality, nor is it a vast population, nor is it really a history or culture. As far as I can see, their America, and they say love America, is an ideological abstraction. It's an emotive symbol that can be embodied in other abstract symbols like the flag. It's a, a sort of almost a love without content. I mean, how else can you love a flag? I mean, a flag, as you know, 
is a piece of rag on a stick, and it's got colors and things. And if you love that flag, and that flag's a symbol of your country, it's a kind of love that doesn't seem to have a content to it. Well, having said that, let me contradict myself. Because there is, a, there is one real content to the super patriotism. Its main substance is militarism. The pacifist and political scientist and activist, by the way, good pacifists are all not passive, they're pacifists and they're quite active. The pacifist and activist, Milford Sibley, he once noted, quote, patriotism for most professional patriots seems to be inseparably connected with military violence and war. Indeed, the most militaristic among us seem to think that they are the most patriotic. Isn't that rather extraordinary? Patriotic virtues are equated with military ones. Our history's patriotic vignettes are usually military ones. Valley Forge, the Alamo, Gettysburg, the battleship Maine, Pearl Harbor, raising the flag on Iwo Jima, D-Day, the MIAs and POWs, and the like. Our country right or wrong, but mostly our country at war or ready for war. The commemorations of our national leaders during national holidays would be incomplete without the marching troops, the weapon displays, uh, martial music, formations of fighter planes zooming overhead. Even in local communities, when they organize patriotic celebrations, they usually appear the marching bands in, in semi-martial uniforms, the high school cadets with rifles on their shoulders, and if there's, a, if there's an army base nearby, even troops. I remember once sitting in, in Urbana, Illinois, standing there July 4th, watching this parade come by, and on this float was suddenly this missile, sort of small missile, but there was this instrument of death on this float that was going by, and there were some people around me, and you know what they did? They started to applaud this inanimate object. I mean, there wasn't even a pilot or, you know, somebody else tending to it or a soldier striding it and waving and going, yow, look at me, you know. Uh, I mean, it was too much for me. I, they were just applauding this, this weapon, this weapon. And then there was a, a jet, little jet fighter came by on the float, and they started applauding that too. This was at a time when these things were being used in Vietnam. Well, even July 4th fireworks sometimes, uh, themselves, July 4th fireworks are really a benign representation or replication of the rocket's red glare, the bombs bursting in air as the top patriotic song on our patriotic hit parade goes. Max Weber once said that the state's irreducible characteristic is a monopoly on the legitimate use of violence. And to be sure, state ceremonies in most states include some display of military force. Now, the way super patriots express their national pride leaves me uncomfortable. It seems the love we are to have for our country rests on some kind of competition with other countries, that it comes at an expense with other countries. It's a love that is predicated on some invidious comparison to other countries being lesser, being not as good. If we love our country, we have to believe it's better than any other. The super patriots will even ask us, don't you think this is the best country in the world? So that you love it because it's better. It's, you know, it's something better. This, by the way, we might recognize immediately as the being number one syndrome. I, I guess I must have heard about being number one for a long time, but uh, I, the first time it ever stuck in my mind was when I heard President Richard Nixon sometime in the late 60s announce, and I quote, Ameri I'll do my Richard Nixon. America is still number one. The, the, never, the still, of course, you know, hints at some anxiety that there might be some slippage there. So I'm listening to this and I'm saying, okay, number one, that's, hey, number one, that makes me feel, you know, makes me feel like number one and that's pretty good. Um, but I was bothered by it because it, it presumed that we were in some kind of adversarial relationship to other nations, all other countries, and that somehow our greatness and our goodness could only be measured in comparison to them, only in our ability to be the top banana. So I said, all right, we're number one. And then one of those troublesome questions came again in my head, and I said, 
If we're number one, what are we number one in? I mean, what are you number one in? So I thought, I said, population? And then, no, the, the Chinese walk away with all the awards in that category. Uh, geography? No, I think the Soviets and even Canada has more real estate than we do. We're not number one in size. I mean, Brazil, there's a number of countries, I think. I don't even want to think about it, uh, about all the countries that might be ahead of us there. Steel production and other basic industries? I perked up a little. Well, we used to be number one in that, uh, but we have slipped down the list because our super patriot corporate leaders have taken to abandoning our communities and exporting our jobs and bringing the factories off to Taiwan and Argentina and South Korea where they can work for slave labor wages, which when you think about it is not the way for super patriots to act, really, you know, take our factories away and all that. So I said, well, what are we number one? Are we number one in cuisine? Please, please. I mean, in that category, we are strictly double digits. <laughs> Way behind, you know, France, China, Japan, Mexico, Italy, India, Greece, and, and others. Are we number one in trade? I know we used to be number one in trade, but I believe the Japanese have outstripped us, or so it would seem to anybody who's walked into any department store in the last couple of years. Uh, um, so the question remains, I was sitting there saying, well, what are we number one in, you know? And the best I can tell from the super patriotic utterances is that it gets down to two things. One, wealth with no concern as to how the wealth is distributed and how it's used and for what effects, and military power, with no concern again with how that military power is used and for whose interests that it might serve at home and abroad. A few years ago, President Reagan exclaimed, quote, we are, prou we are proud of America. We love America. America is the greatest. Now the greatest, and when you say America is the greatest, that's another way of saying number one. America is number one. Now, supposedly, we can love America and be proud of our country because it's so great. The implication is, however, that if it weren't so great, it wouldn't be so lovable. And that tr began to trouble me. The super patriot's love of country seems predicated on the country's being up there, stronger and superior to other countries. What happens if it's going to slip? What happens? I started thinking, really, I started thinking, what about people from lesser lands, as we might call them? I mean, what about somebody from Luxembourg? I mean, now, Luxembourg is, is number 122, you know. I mean, just barely ahead of uh, San Marino in its military might. Um, I said, what does someone from Luxembourg do? Do they go around shamefaced like this, you know? You say, you from Luxembourg? You from Luxembourg? I say, no, no, I'm French. No, no I'm French. Um, and you say, do you love your country? You know, they say, well, what, what, what is there to love? I mean, a few, a few border police, no army, no navy. I mean, it's a... Uh... The super patriots were exhilarated by the U.S. aggression perpetrated against Grenada. To them, such military exploits are an affirmation of our nation's strength and worth, and therefore their own individual strength and worth. I mean, there are some people who went around who really got off on the invasion of Grenada. So, oh, we really kicked their ass out. Whoa, you know, like the Washington Redskins versus St. Mary's Junior High School football team. Huh? Oh, we really gave it to them. Ronald Reagan, the conqueror of Grenada, <laughs> reflecting upon his greatest military victory, hailed the venture as an example of how the U.S. defends democracy. Since the U.S. has taken over in Grenada, Grenada's unemployment rate has tripled. Since it's been liberated from Moscow's yoke, Grenada's native enterprises and development projects and health and education programs that were initiated by the New Jewel Movement have been abolished and been rolled back. Grenada is once more safe for private capital penetration. And the Reagan invasion served notice to the Caribbean nations they had better not try to develop alternative social orders 
that go against the multinational corporate way of doing things. That's what the invasion was about. And Ronald Reagan was right when he said it's not a question of nutmeg. It was not a question of direct U.S. capital investment in the country, which was small because it's, it's only a country of 110,000 people. It was a question of serving notice to the Caribbean that you cannot be masters of your own destiny. You cannot develop your resources, your labor, your land, your capital, and your technology for yourselves. You are there to be milked by us. That is by people of Ronald Reagan's class, not by us. We got milked on that too. We paid for that expedition. We paid for that invasion. It was our sons who died in that invasion. And it was more than 18, I assure you. Uh, if questions were raised about the number of people killed. Now, most super patriots don't think about Grenada in that way. They think about it the other way. You know, it was a real victory, as I say. But most of the world didn't see that invasion as some kind of um, victory. It, was it wasn't perceived as a sign of strength by Latin America and most other nations. It was seen as a sign of weakness. It wasn't seen as, as a glorious thing. It was seen as a shameful thing. When the most powerful country in the world has to invade a, a micro state of 110,000 people and feel proud that they won, there were more, there were more citations given for heroism on Grenada than there were soldiers that went. There were literally hundreds of citations for officers, lieutenant colonels, and all that. Many of them never left the Pentagon through that whole operation. And they were all given these citations by Mr. Reagan to validate the heroism, the enormous accomplishment, the patriotism of this great venture. If anything, Grenada ought to make us wonder that maybe America isn't number one. Indeed, there's someone going around this country who's saying that. He's the presidential candidate for the Democratic Party. In a speech in Chicago in March 1988, during the primary campaigns, Michael Dukakis said, quote, we need a strategy that will make America number one. I said, make America number one? I thought it was number one. I mean, certainly since Grenada we're number one. I see that with these, Demo these liberals sowing seeds of doubt in our minds. The next month in Cleveland, Michael Dukakis announced, we're going to take charge of our economic future and we're not going to stop until America is number one. Like all his predecessors, Dukakis doesn't explain what's so important about being number one. Or what the hell does it mean to be number one anyway? This preoccupation with being number one strikes me, ladies and gentlemen, as I say, as a sign of weakness, not of strength, as a sign of insecurity, not of security. A people who know who they are don't worry about being number one. A people who are in touch with the deeper values of social justice and democracy don't get a number one thrill from stomping on a tiny nation. A people who seek friendship and cooperation with other peoples don't need to lord it over other nations and outshine them. A people who, uh, such a people don't have to find reassurances in themselves by looking, or imagining, looking at or imagining the deficiencies of others. And they don't feel threatened by the accomplishments and strengths of other people. They don't panic when they fail to win the most gold medals or the most medals at the Olympics. Do you watch the Olympic coverage? I mean, it's an amazing case of super patriotism. I remember the 84, was it the 84, the LA Olympics, the Summer Olympics. There was one swim meet I, I watched and the camera was on this American swimmer the whole time. The guy came in third. And, they, and as he came in, the announcement of who won, who got the, who got the gold and silver, wasn't made by the ABC announcer. You could hear it, like in the pool. It was an off, off mic announcement. I suppose you could hear it, but I, I didn't catch it. And they just kept saying, I forget the guy's name. Well, Tom feels bad about that. Yeah, let's get a replay on that last spin. And the camera followed him getting out of the water and walking along. Yeah, it's really terrible. Yeah. And I'm keep saying, who won, who won that mat? Who won it? Who won it? I mean, who were the other guys? Were they, was anybody else swimming in that pool? Uh, and they covered him all the way. You literally could not find out who won it. The, 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 the Winter Olympics in 84, I noticed as the GDR kept winning more medals, the age at which their athletes began training got younger and younger. 
They won a few medals, and the announcer said, well, in East Germany, the athletes, uh, I hear the kids, they begin training at, at 11 and 12 years old. Then they won a few more medals by day three. They were saying, and uh, I hear they begin training at as young as seven and eight. And by the end, they won a few more medals, and they said, well, in the GDR, they, they, uh, they begin training as young as four and five. And there was a cut shot of these little toddlers on the ice skates with their parents. And I, and I say, my God, those commies are just ruthless what they do to their children. <laughs> Super patriotic morality is an inversion of individual morality. For the super patriot, the, the nation state is something more than an instrumental value. It's something more than a way of organizing order and law and whatever else to carry out other good things in life. It's not merely an instrumental value. It becomes an end value in itself. Those other things are no longer the end. They become instruments to serve this end. The state is no longer there to serve us. We are here to serve and glorify the state. The state becomes an entity, a force unto itself, a powerfully abstracted symbol that claims our ultimate and total loyalty, a moral object, a moral entity in itself whose existence and growth are taken as self-justifying. You know, a question could be raised. What's so important about the state existing and growing and, and, and continuing and expanding and flourishing, whatever else? That's taken as self-justifying. In fact, that question would be considered unpatriotic. The moral code that applies to nationalism does not operate the same as the moral code that applies to individuals. The premises that, that, that governs all individual morality is that your behavior must at some point lead to self-restraint and even self-sacrifice. In individual morality, there are certain things you should not do, even if they're convenient, advantageous, and whatever else, even if you have the impulse for them, even if they advance your self-interest, you must not do them. That's what the whole essence or code of individual morality is, as in thou shalt not. <clears throat> These premises are inverted when applied to a nation's behavior, and they often lead to terrible and untrammeled excesses. Individual morality is predicated on the notion that sin, that is harmful and unjust behavior, that's what I mean by sin. There is such a thing as sin, harmful and unjust behavior. <clears throat> That sin is always within the human potential. To sin, uh, to err is human, to sin is all too human. But the nation state is something more than human, and there lies the power of its appeal. At the heart of the super patriotic ethic is the belief that the nation's existence and its actions are so endowed with virtue as to place it above the commonplace rules of life. The restraints that apply to ordinary humans don't restrain the nation. So convinced of its supreme virtue, the nation knows no other restraint than the limitations of its own self-interest, its own desires, and the limitations of its own power. So ultimately, the restraint on a nation is the limitation of its power and the power of others. Ladies and gentlemen, the difference between individual morality and national morality is a very real one. When the aggrandizing individual commits an evil or harmful act, there's some sense that he is to be punished, he or she, or should be punished. Uh, at least some questions raised about whether proper standards of conduct haven't been violated. But some of the most outrageous acts, which would be outrageous under an individual moral code and unsupportable, unsupportable in civil life, are applauded as heroism when performed in the name of the nation. Thou shalt not becomes thou shalt do anything by any means necessary if it can be said to be in the national interest and if it serves national security. Well, who are the super patriots? <clears throat> they can be found in high and low places. They can be found in the White House and they can be found in your local American Legion post. But super patriotism, I would argue, is not a product of mass psychology. It's not a product of mass macho psychology as such, although it certainly appeals to machismo, often resorting to a kind of John Wayne foreign approach to foreign policy. I'll give you one quote. President Lyndon Johnson, the U.S. is... A, is uh, 
The U.S. will not act the great giant that is having its hands tied to get pushed around by a little dwarf, a little dwarf armed with a penknife. That's Ronald Reagan, uh, uh, sorry, Lin same guys. Same. That was, that's Lyndon Johnson talking. The little dwarf with the penknife was Vietnam. Um, we've been taught to think that the uh, Archie Bunker is the prototype of the super patriot. In fact, Archie is one of its victims, one of super patriotism's victims. He's one of its consumers. He pays the taxes, he bleeds, he sends his kids off and all that and he falls for it. The suppliers, the pushers of super patriotism, most conspicuously are our top political leaders, our publicists, our media pundits, our institutional heads, including some college presidents and corporation leaders. Super patriotic ideology is assiduously propagated by the ruling class of this society. That is the essence, that has been the essence of the Reagan propaganda effort over these eight years. Like the anti-communist ideology, which is just the other side of that same coin, it is not a product of mass hysteria, although its goal often is to instigate mass hysteria. But ideas do not float around in social space. You see, there's no such thing as just an idea around, like a virus. In fact, viruses don't quite float around. They, they, they go according to certain social relations. Um, and so with ideas, ideas are mediated through the social structure, through social organization, through a social system. That is through organized status roles, groups, families, schools, communities, media, other institutions, whatever else. And some ideas then are mass marketed. Some ideas are taught to us from day one in those little flag salutes we have at school. That Ronald Reagan isn't just getting off in irrelevant things when he talks about flag salutes and prayers in the schools and, and, and pushing those symbols in school. He wants to institutionalize, he wants to internalize within kids at the first grade level, if you will, this, this gut instinct to wave that flag, to rally around that flag, to get in there when it's El, the Pueblo or the Grenada or Central America or whatever else, and not ask too many questions and just say, my country, and I love my country, and let's do it. It's, I think it's not a manifestation of individual psychology. I think it's a mediated thing because the super patriotism, machoism, is not, it's not something that just swaggers around in any direction. It's directed toward very particular, specific political goals. It has very specific targets, like Cuba, Vietnam, Nicaragua, the USSR, Grenada, countries that are, or, or in case of Grenada, were developing social orders that threatened global capitalism. But in relation to some other countries, the super patriots aren't so macho. In fact, they're very passive, very suffering, very accommodating, very supportive. They don't have the macho virtues that what the patriarchs would call the feminine virtues almost. They're, they're this way when it comes to Chile, Guatemala, El Salvador, Indonesia, South Africa, Israel, South Korea, Zaire. Um, countries that support the interests of multinational capitalism and imperialism. So psychological categories in politics offer some explanation regarding predispositions, but they do not explain the actual policy directions. For that, you have to look at such things as class interests, economic interests, and other such things. One of the, the key functions of super patriotism is to blur the differences in class interests in our society and try to convince us that we're all in the same boat, rich and poor alike, you, me, the Mellons, the Morgans, the Rockefellers. We are to made to believe that the people of the United States have a community of interest with the giant multinationals. The very companies that at any time might export our jobs and abandon and desert our communities in that very unpatriotic way, as I said before. Um, in truth, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, on almost every issue, we the people are not in the same boat with the big financiers and companies. Pol pol the costs of our policies are not equally shared. We pay the brunt of the costs. The benefits of our policies are not equally enjoyed. We don't get much of that. I give you the case of the Persian Gulf, where it's costing us 
two and a half dollars for every dollar's worth of oil that's coming out of the Persian Gulf. That's not so irrational because we're paying the two and a half and the oil companies are making the dollar. Even if it's not coming to the U.S., only 4% of that comes to the U.S. The Seven Sisters, the oil companies, the big oil cartels don't care if they sell it in the U.S. or in Japan, France, which is where it's really going. And we're not protecting the oil supply for Japan or France. We are protecting the oil supply of those companies. So there's a case of policy not being shared equally. There's a case where you have to have a class analysis rather than a flag-waving analysis. This is true, by the way, this is equally true of ancient empires as well as modern empires. In 1919, the conservative economists, very, very uh, prominent economists, a very creative one too, Joseph Schumpeter, he described the imperialism of classical Rome in words that might sound familiar to present day Americans. Quote, that policy which pretends to aspire to peace but unerringly generates war. The policy of continual preparation for war. The policy of meddlesome interventionism. He's writing in 1919 about ancient Rome. There was no corner of the known world where some interest was not alleged to be in danger or under attack. If the interests were not Roman, they were those of Rome's allies. And if Rome had no allies, then allies would be invented. When it was utterly impossible to contrive such an interest, why, then it was the national honor that had been insulted. The fight was always invested with an aura of legality. Rome was always being attacked by evil-minded neighbors, always fighting for a breathing space. The whole world was pervaded by a host of enemies, and it was manifestly Rome's duty to guard against their indubitably aggressive designs. They were enemies who only waited to fall upon the Roman people. Such a policy can be understood, Schumpeter continues, only by ascertaining what, quote, domestic class interests benefited from it. Even, you see, conservatives can, can have a class analysis as long as it's 2,000 years ago. They won't do it here. What domestic class interests benefited from the growth, the ruthlessness, the power of the Roman Empire? Schumpeter goes on, he says, those who gained were the aristocracy of landlords, agricultural entrepreneurs, born of struggle against their own people, whose dominance rested, that is the entrepreneurs and landlords, their dominance rested on control of the state machine. The historian Ernst Badian, also talking about Rome, no administration in history has ever devoted itself so wholeheartedly to fleecing its subjects for the private benefit of its ruling class as Rome of the last age of the Republic. And he too was writing before the Reagan administration came into office. Now, seeing the hypocrisy and evil that's done under the name of patriotism, there were many on the left, especially during the Vietnam era, who began attacking the symbols of patriotism, who began attacking the symbols of our country. They put blame on everything on an entity called America, and they even spelt America with three Ks. They burned American flags, thereby convincing millions of our compatriots that they were traitors, or nuts in any case. They blamed America for what was being done in its name by a coterie of imperialists and militarists and capitalists. Can everybody hear me okay? Back there? Okay. And these imperialists and militarists and capitalists, in turn, legitimated their own crimes by wrapping themselves around this same flag. They were a lot smarter. While, while we in the new left were burning flags, I, I never burned a flag, but I mean, you know, we, our guys, were burning flags. They were wrapping themselves around in the flag. And they could conveniently brand then all opposition to their policies as attacks against America. Not criticism of Nixon, not attacks of Nixon's policies, but attacks against America. It was giving them then a remarkable psychological advantage. It became very easy for ruling class representatives like Richard Nixon that day, and today people like Gene Kirkpatrick and Ronald Reagan, to brand the protesters as part of that, quote, hate America crowd. I think, I think perhaps the anarchist tendencies in the new left added fuel to this super patriotic bonfire. Anarchists see the state as the enemy rather than the particular policies and particular class interests of particular states. In a sense, I would argue, I don't want to push this too much, but that they're a mirror image of the super patriots. They elevate the state to a disembodied entity 
one that's supremely evil. The super patriot elevates it to an entity that's supremely virtuous. Um, that has an end, is an end of itself and a moral existence of its own. And so they attack the symbols of the state and they play right into the hands of leaders who have always sought, who always seek to equate ruling class interests with the state itself, who always seek to equate their particular class interests with the general interests, who always seek to equate their policies, their ventures with the needs of the American people. Leaders who equate their rotten, unjust policies with the good name of our nation. Now, in contrast to the super patriots, it begins to brighten here. I'm almost finished, let me say. In contrast to the super patriots are the real patriots. We who, for instance, don't want to see the good name of our nation sullied. Real patriots love their country enough to want to improve it. And their patriotism has a social content, and that social content is social justice. Real patriots do things the American way, the democratic way, not with secret crypto-fascist coteries in the national security state, but with open debate and open challenges against privileged interests. Real patriots know that democracy is not just the ability to hold elections, but to serve and fulfill the basic needs and interests of the demos, the people, Real patriots are also internationalists. They may love and feel attached to their country, but they also love the peoples of all countries, all being different representations of the human family. Real patriots educate themselves about the real history of their country, and they're not satisfied with the flag-waving promo stuff. They want a people's history, as written by people like Philip Fona, Eric Fona, Boyes and Marais, Herbert Apthecker, and Howard Zinn. Real patriots Real patriots find different things in our history to be proud of than the super patriots do. We're proud of things like the struggle for the enfranchisement, the abolitionist movement, the peace movement, the abolition of child labor, the struggle for collective bargaining, the, the extension of universal suffrage to uh, people of color and to women, the, the struggle for racial justice, the eight hour day, occupational safety, the struggle for gender equality. In the real patriots pantheon can be, find, can be found Tom Paine, Harriet Tubman, Frederick Douglass, Mark Twain, Susan B. Anthony, Big Bill Haywood, John Reed, Eugene Victor Debs, Elizabeth Gurley Flynn, William Z. Foster, A.J. Musty, Harry Bridges, Martin Luther King, and Senator Garland. And, <laughs> and not just... <clears throat> And not just those notables, but not just those notables, but the thousands and the tens of thousands and the millions of people in the ranks who fought all those struggles, who raised up those leaders, who brought up those leaders, brought them forth and made them uh, national and political realities. And if we are super patriots, ladies and gentlemen, I think what we finally have to do now is to start to advocate perestroika. I tell, I tell us, I say, you know what we Americans have to be? We real patriots, we gotta be more selfish. We can't be like the super patriots, they're selfless. They wanna die, they wanna kill, they wanna die for their country, they wanna kill people for their country, they wanna die for their country. And they're, and they're selfless because they never worry about the quality of our life. They're always concerned about the Cubans, the Chinese and the Russians. Are they free? Are they getting both sides of the story? Are the, what's the quality of their life there? Be a little more selfish. Think about our own life. Think about us. And what we need is a perestroika in our own country. And I mean that. I mean we need, we need something like the equivalent of a Gorbachev and a whole movement. And it's not an individual. Gorbachev isn't just some white knight tilting against Soviet bureaucrats. He couldn't have become Secretary General if he did not represent a very powerful and important social formation in that country. There's a lot of people in that country who have the feeling that things have got to change and they've got to change in a fundamental way. And there's a lot of people in this country that think things have got to change and they've got to change in a fundamental way. But our leaders don't talk about that, and our media don't talk about that. And while we sit very patronizingly saying, well, the Soviets are learning how to be self-critical. Is it going far enough? Will it be deep enough? Is it really real? We might ask the question, what about ourselves? We need change. We need to tax the rich and not the poor. We need to restructure the use of energy to save the environment and ourselves. We need less hogwash about affirmative action. 
Because all this publicity given to affirmative action has convinced all sorts of people that women and people of color are looking for special treatment. Always be suspicious of an issue when the media gives it a lot of attention. Because we know that affirmative action isn't the problem. The truth is the real problem in this country is the persistent and virulent racism and sexism in training, recruitment, hiring, job evaluation, wages, salaries, and personal relations. And that's the struggle, the struggle for equality. It's not for some special treatment. We need a health insurance program for the 35 million Americans who are not covered. I mean, isn't that amazing? Isn't it time for an investigation? How could that be? How did that come about? Why? We need people who not only bemoan these things, like the liberals say, isn't it a shame, the homeless? Isn't it a shame, not enough adequate health care? Isn't it a shame? You have to stop complaining about that. You have to start asking, but why does that exist? What are the forces that allow, in the richest country in the world, these kinds of terrible inhumanities and inequalities? And not just national health insurance, we need we need a national health program for everyone. We also need glasnost, not only perestroika, we need glasnost. Glasnost means an opening up of opinion and debate also. We need some relief from the evasive, fatuous, mealy-mouthed, know-it-all anti-communist media pundits and conservative columnists, the gas bags who sit there. You see them now with elections? Here's some candidates who are trying to talk about the issues, most notably Jesse Jackson. And what do these guys do? They have become theater critics. The show is over and they say, well, Bob, what do you think? Well, I thought his delivery was very good. He, was, he seemed calm, he had a good rapport with the audience and he used that one thing very effectively. Yes, he did. Uh, he ran into a little trouble. On the other hand, Senator Zone seemed, seemed not quite had it together today. He, was, he, was, he seemed like he probably tired because he's been, he's been on the road so long. Yes, I think that's what it was. And I'm sitting there and I'm saying, what the hell have I got to hear this for? What is this theater critic stuff? No one, they don't even, they don't talk about the issue. They talk about process. In fact, they talk about talking about process. The airwaves of this country, ladies and gentlemen, are the property of the people of the United States. That may come as a surprise to some network bosses, but it's true. And those airways should be opened up. There should be public access television. We need exposure to a socialist perspective. We need exposure to various dissident, dissident perspectives in the mainstream media. Not just, as I say, ideas are mediated through a social structure, and some of them get the mass market, and some of them are left for very small and select audiences. And we need discussion of worker-controlled enterprises and public ownership. We need a national debate in the mainstream media on the oppressive, unjust purposes of U.S. foreign policy in the third world and elsewhere. We need to re-examine our institutions, our schools, our colleges, hospitals, museums. We've got to find out why all those institutions, our media, why they are all dominated by self-selected boards of trustees or regents who are answerable to no one but themselves and who control all spending, all hiring, and all other policies. We need a government that has the capacity to go directly into not-for-profit production. If private industry can't provide the needs of the people, if the utilities can't give you electricity without jacking up the rates every year, jacking it up again and again, then take it away from the utilities and the people themselves can do it themselves. If private industry can't build us homes and hospitals and get jobs, then let the public sector do it. There's all these people who need work. There's all this work that needs to be done. There's all this capital that can be used to do it, and none of it's come together because there's no profits in it for the Morgans and the Rockefellers and the DuPonts. So then let the public sector do it, not for profit, and it will get done. And when it gets done, it creates social income, it creates private income, it expands your tax base, it creates public income, and it creates more opportunities for growth. The, the danger with that, the danger is not that it won't work, the danger is that it does work. And that's why they stop it, that's why they want privatization, that's why they sell off Conrail at one third its actual value, because Conrail under public ownership was working, and those railroads under private ownership were milked like cows 
cows, milked and run down, and then they turn around to the government, they turn around to the taxpayer, and then they go socialist after they've milked it down and it's, and it's about to fall apart and they say, we can't run it anymore. You're gonna have to take it over. And the taxpayers take it over and they dig deeper into their pockets and they pay for it and they put it back on a working basis, a rational basis, a not-for-profit basis, so that the money it makes goes back into it and doesn't go out to the George Bushes and the Ronald Reagans and their class. And then when it works, Ronald Reagan says, we got to sell this thing. And he sells it not because it wasn't working, but because it does work. We need to open up our political system, ladies and gentlemen. We need to have new parties, not just two capitalist parties, not just two anti-communist parties. Not just one party that red baits and liberal baits and another party that lives in fear of being red baited and liberal baited. <laughs> we need to do what the Sandinistas in Nicaragua have done, which is have proportional representation so that if a minority party wins 11% of the vote in Nicaragua, it gets 11% of the seats in the National Assembly. They don't tell you that in the media. Ronald Reagan hasn't dwelled on that fact, has he? We need, a, as the Sandinistas have done, we need funding for minority parties. We need free TV time for minority parties. Conservatives palm themselves off as being more patriotic than liberals. Liberals think they're more patriotic than socialists and others on the left. But we on the left are second to no one in our patriotism. We want perestroika. We want fundamental restructuring and democratization of overseas and domestic policies. We want a restructuring and democratization of the political process, the values, institutions, the economy, and the class power of this country. We real patriots say, along with Albert Camus, I want to love my country and justice too. And in fact, I believe that the only way you can be a real patriot is to love justice. Because you can't love, you can't be patriotic to something that's unjust. We want to spend less time trying to save the world with bombers and battleships and more time healing ourselves. This is not just a good idea or a noble pronouncement. It is a historical necessity. This country does not belong to Ronald Reagan and his billionaire friends, although they act like it does. It belongs to us, and sooner or later, we will take it back. Thank you. Thank you. We'll have a 10-minute intermission, and then we'll have a question and answer session. Thank you. So I know it might be a bit difficult and inconvenient, but we'd really be appreciative if you'll do that. Thank you. Let's take it. you make it now. Yes, yes, sir. <clears throat> Some of the biggest mistakes dissidents could make in the next couple of decades. What are the big pitfalls to avoid? A uh, biggest mistake. What are some of the biggest mistakes that dissidents could make in the next couple of decades? Um, <clears throat> well, we have very limited resources, so uh, the margin of error for us is much narrower than for the rich and powerful. They can make mistakes and recover and all that, so we do have to be careful. Maybe one of the biggest mistakes is to, is to get, um, is, to, is to adopt ultra-left positions which say the whole thing stinks, this is all a big game, man, uh, uh, why get into it? Um, I think in this time uh, we are facing real mean-spirited reactionary right-wing ideologues. We're facing ruthless imperialism which is showing its murderous capacity in Central America. I think there's no 
no level of involvement that's too small. There's no democratic victory that's too small. So we should work at every level by every means necessary, running candidates, supporting progressive candidates, supporting even reasonably liberal candidates against right-wingers. Um, I think we should uh, <clears throat> As write letters, answer the mail. I think we should uh, uh, support alternative media like KGNU. Um, um, these are these are these are important things, and so political struggle at all levels. Uh, so the worst uh, the worst thing we could do is think that political struggle is a lot of baloney. It's just a trap, or it's just a co-optation. But that's one of the mistakes, I guess. Um, uh, I, I don't know. I haven't thought of it. I, I don't. I don't usually. I don't usually criticize the left. There's so many people who criticize the left in the left. I mean, they always start off their talks by criticizing the left, kind of placing themselves above it or apart. But but certainly, you're right. We should. I should. I should. We should all give more careful thinking to uh, tactics and strategy in working for social change and for social justice. Okay, thanks. All right. <clears throat> uh, hi, I'd be interested in some of your thoughts about what's going on in the Soviet Union these days. Uh, I th th believe I heard you describe yourself as a Marxist-Leninist recently on, on the radio. Um, I said I said I'd be willing to take that description if the people who heard it knew what was meant by it. Mm -hmm. uh, right. Sometimes I avoid it only because uh, people don't know and they just uh, throw mm -hmm. bad words around. Yeah. I just saw an article in, by William Pfaff in the New Yorker um, where he was arguing that the Soviets are in the process of throwing out a lot of the fundamental tenets of Marxism, Leninism themselves, the dictatorship of the proletariat, democratic centralism, uh, etc. In fact, uh, I just heard that a, a group of high-level uh, people from the Central Committee or sent by the Central Committee are going to be up in Telluride next week and uh, meeting with John Nesbitt and a bunch of people with the intent of basically, as I understand it, trying to figure out what to do next in the Soviet Union now that they appear to be throwing out so much of their um, ideology. So I'd just be curious about your thoughts about where you see them going, what kind of success you see for them. Well, the basic tenet of Marxism-Leninism is that it must be applied in a very living way to changing social conditions. So to change is not to throw out the tenant, because the basic tenant is, in fact, to readjust and reassess. They're not throwing out the tenant of the dictatorship of the proletariat. The dictatorship of the proletariat was never a dictatorship. It's a democracy. It's a dictatorship in the sense that it does not allow, allow political freedom for that other class which is those who own the means of production. And the word class, as used in Marxism-Leninism, is somewhat different from the way the word is used in American sociology and even in common parlance. It was using the word the way I was using it in my talk. It's a relationship to the means of production, a relationship to power and wealth. In that sense, the Soviets did believe, and they still do believe, and they have not retreated from that tenet, and Gorbachev believes it as well as anybody, that they have won an historic victory over a class. They have won an historic victory over a particular epoch in their own society, over capitalism and feudalism, and they will never go back to that. What they have also discovered, though, is that socialism isn't that easy to build that when you give equal, <clears throat> equal pay to everybody, that some people don't perform all that well, that people will operate against the system and find rewards doing it that way, better rewards than the diffuse abstracted rewards of building the revolution, that managers will be managers and bureaucrats will be bureaucrats as they are at, at Colorado, at the University of Colorado, as they are in, <clears throat> in Washington, as they are Everywhere they will, they will tend to be empire builders, they will be patters, they will, they will uh, win advancements by how well they please their superiors rather than how innovative or imaginative they can be. Um, these are the kind of problems that the Soviets are facing. They're trying to figure out now how they could use the market dynamic, and the market dynamic means the needs and, and consumer desires of the people in a way that will uh, advance production 
help, and better help consumerism without moving to a free market economy which would lead to enormous inequalities, accumulations of wealth. You see, when you determine that your resources are going to be invested according to the free market, then money goes where money can be made. And problems arise. We see that happening in China right now. The Chinese peasants are told, go ahead and get yourself rich. Okay, so these peasants look around and they can make calculations. They say, on this acreage that I have, I can, I can produce so much rice with irrigation and all this stuff, and I'll make so many. What do you get in China, yen? I forget. What? Yawn. Yawn, I get so many yawn. I get so, many, so much money. Uh, but if I, if I, in fact, build a fish pond here and produce fish, I'll get much more. So you have all sorts of Chinese building fish ponds. Well, the fish supply goes up. That's great, and some city dwellers like it. But China, for the first time since 1949, now has a grain shortage. This is the China that, when I was a kid, my social studies teacher said there will always be starvation in China because there's too many people. There was 400 million people. That was back when the U.S. had about 170 million, or 100 and, I forget, 145 million. Um, today, with almost a, with a billion people, no one is starving. However, if they, but but it means also that you know everybody's kind of poor. Uh, there ain't that much, but everybody gets something, and everybody has some food. Now they're going to move toward these other things of self-enrichment, which will supposedly increase production, but it may very well lead to very serious problems like unemployment and like food shortages and all. In fact, it already is doing that, some people say. The Soviets are, I think, trying to figure out how they can do something that's like Hungary but doesn't end up being Yugoslavia, which is what Hungary is going to become. Yugoslavia started developing social capital. They call it social capital. They decentralized. See, decentralization isn't the big problem. Gorbachev, would, these guys would decentralize tomorrow if they thought it could solve the economic problem. As envisioned here, it's always represented as the centralist bureaucrats who don't want to give up their power to the good, democratic, decentralized people. That's not it. It's that they have a very real ideological commitment and a very factual commitment and understand that if you decentralize like this, you may end up with Yugoslavia. You may end up with unemployment. You may end up with the efficient factories, the more mechanized, better factories out producing and getting more. You may end up with the anarchy of production. You may end up with um, uh, inflation. And in fact, inflation is one of the things you're getting in China already, where people are now marketing goods. They just jack up the prices, and everybody's jacking up the prices, and you've got terrible inflation. Um, so you can end up with stores that are full but people that, who are hungry. We know about that. We have a whole country like that with stores that are full and with 20, what, 30 million people living below the poverty level and an estimated about 12 million people in this country don't get enough to eat. So these are very hard and difficult questions as to how you decentralize. What do you decentralize to? They are not decentralizing ownership. They're going to decentralize responsibility for production. And they want to, of course, get rid of the stultifying effects of bureaucracy. They also want to develop more accountability and responsibility. Contrary to the view that centralization controls everything, quite the opposite. Being so overly centralized, you couldn't keep track of every operation that's going on in a massive economy like that. The, 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 uh, the consequences were that in many factories you had people filling out false quota, reporting imaginary productions, covering up all sorts of mistakes, running little black markets on the side, and all that sort of thing. They could get away with it. So now they really want, in fact, more accountability at the factory level. So the decentralization doesn't mean less accountability in the free market. It's just trying to get a way of getting more accountability, but while avoiding the other effects of a, of a capitalist market. I don't think history has shown a way out. I don't think Gorbachev has a solution. Um, and I think it's a very tough thing that he's facing. And it's more than just tilting against some bureaucrats. Bureaucracy is definitely part of the problem. Um, the nature of all bureaucracy is that it must have a systematic mode of operation. It's called the SOP, 
standard operating procedure in order for it to be reliable and precision. And bureaucracy is a very powerful and advanced tool of rule. Bureaucracy is to other forms of decision making as machine power is to other forms of labor. It has division of labor, it, it works, and it's very powerful. Uh, uh, getting a man on the moon was a bureaucratic achievement as well as a scientific one. Um, <clears throat> Social security system is a bureaucratic achievement. The whole Pentagon's a bureaucracy, for better or worse, for worse in my view, of course. But um, <clears throat> there's no way you can do it without bureaucracy. But what happens is, given an SOP, a standard operating procedure, then you must go through certain forms. And the tendency then is to limit options and limit agendas and, and, and become, in fact, a stultifying thing. So the problem is that all social systems have the defects of their own virtues. And this is what he's dealing with. And the question is, can we move to a new stage? That's what perestroika is. It's very tough. Glasnost is the easy part. I've told that to Soviet scholars when I, I was talking with them. Uh, where was the State University? Of New, one of the New York State Universities, I forget now. Um, and I said, I said, I think, I think Glasnost will be easy. They agreed. They said, yeah, Glasnost will be easy. What Glasnost is, is that somebody woke up in the Kremlin and he said, hey, what do you know? We don't have a society of half-starved muzhiks and peasants and, uh, you know, we now have a whole society of engineers, scientists, technicians, at an educational level, which is one of the highest in the world. Maybe we ought to stop treating them like five-year-olds and let them see the movies they want to see and let them do this and let them do that. And it means you're going to then have to make room for more creative things and also for more stupid and silly things. You're going to get all sorts of pretensions. You know, I listen to the Soviet directors and Soviet artists, and they sound as pretentious and full of shit as the American directors and artists. They sound like, well, I'm trying to reach the essence of what the world is and how it... And I say, oh, you're so full of crap. You've got nothing on your mind, and he's going to make this movie, you know. And there are all these geniuses now who are really uncomfortable because the censorship is off them. You know, there were all these geniuses who had this great book, great film, great painting inside, and now it ain't coming out. Like, Go ahead, let's, let's see it. So I'll stop. Go ahead, miss. I'm sorry. Keep you standing. I finished. <clears throat> like lighting a cigarette at the bus stop, uh, sitting down. Right. The minute you light the cigarette, the bus comes. Okay. Okay. Um, I want to uh, go back for clarification to uh, something you, you whizzed through real quickly uh, in your talk about... Um, the, the, the psychological roots or lack of psychological roots for the need to be number one. You, the word machismo went by real fast and it seemed that you were saying that um, the need to be number one doesn't come out of some inner psychological need. It comes out of uh, the uh, ruling class's manipulation of media and education. Is that, is that true? No, uh, yeah, uh, yes, in a way, not the need. Uh, we may have all sorts of, you see, we may have all sorts of needs. And the question is then, how are those needs channelized? They could be channelized into uh, creative forms of competition, you know, which community is going to build the cleaner community, nicer, safer community? You could do it that way. Or it could be channelized into who's going to be tougher, what team is going to win, we're, we're number one. And a lot of that, I believe, this, you see, I don't believe that we're possessed by demons. And much of psychoanalysis, much of psychology really postulates that there are, is in us these demons. They don't call them demons, they call them impulses, needs, uh, uh, complexes, hang-ups, problems, this and that. I don't think we just got that. It's a very 14th century. They used to burn people who had those problems in those days. Now we go around and we make, we make the shrinks rich. That's the difference. Um, I think that a lot of that gets manufactured in a society. I don't believe necessarily that people ha wanted to rampage through a street and break windows and beep their horns and yell, yay, because their football team beat the other city's football team. I think that's learned behavior. I think they learned that because that's all their culture gives them. And if you treat the people like a citizenry, as in Athens, where common citizens started to study rhetoric so they could get up in the assembly and speak, then you'll have citizens. And if you treat the people like a rabble, as they did in Rome, screeching, get their heads off, and go to the bread and circuses and don't have a thing on mind, and hail the emperor, hail Caesar, then you'll have a rabble. If you build and you organize your society to produce a rabble, you'll get a rabble, and if you produce, organize a citizenry, you'll get a citizenry. And um, 
So I think that while it's easy to, re I think it's reductionist to say this is, uh, this is just an outgrowth of our machismo, you see, or something like that. I, uh, because this, this thing, number one, the ordinary macho guy isn't, um, isn't, really, isn't really clamoring for America to be number one, but that's what he keeps hearing. He hears his president say it. He hears that, that that's the thing you gotta be. He links that up to his own security and his own well-being. He, he hears that America is threatened by all sorts of people out there, and the only way he'll survive and his nation, and his family, his community is gonna survive is if we take care of the Russian bear or Gaddafi or, 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 the, or, or the Grenadian menace or, the, or whatever. The next day it could be something else, the Sandinistas in Central America. So those those are things and cues that are being fed. So what I said is the machismo may be a predispositional set, but it doesn't explain the directions of the policy. Is that clear? Is that, is that how do you, how do you explain the, the occurrence of war in, in human history? Well, that's a big question. Uh, the occurrence of war in human history? <laughs> Well, there are, there are plenty of macho people in Switzerland. It's the, how do you explain that the most male chauvinist society doesn't have wars? I mean, you go to Switzerland, there's this place, there's as many neurotics and machismo people and uh, all sorts of other people. Personality distributions may be as r roughly the same as in any other opinion, but they don't have wars, and they don't have wars in Sweden. So I think there are larger social conditions and interests that explain wars. I do not believe that war is something that just springs from the breast of man. And you don't mean people, you mean man in this case. Uh, if men just wanted wars, why must that, why, how do you explain the draft? Why must they be drafted? under penalty of five years in prison? Why do they go into exile? Why do they try to get four Fs if they just want to go fight and kill? There are those particular kinds of personalities. And during Vietnam, they found a very good place. The Navy pilot who said, I love to hit a virgin building in Vietnam. I really get off on it when I bring my plane down. That tells us something about that Navy pilot that doesn't explain the Vietnam War. Because you could bomb in Mexico, you could bomb in Indonesia, you could bomb in Paraguay, you could bomb in South Africa, you could bomb any number of other countries. Why were you bombing in Vietnam? What's that all about? It doesn't explain why, you, why if, if these guys got to go to war. Even Joseph Goebbels said that. He said, nobody wants to go to war, not even a German. Not even a German, he said. <laughs> He said, no poor slob wants to get out of a, a go sit in a, a freezing trench and, 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 and have the stink and smell of blood and death and hear the screams of his buddies wounded and, and lie there with the, with the stink of fear in every pore of his body that he might be killed in the next minute. Nobody wants that, to be torn away from your home, your career, your family. To sit in a freezing trench, you'd rather be home in bed, nice warm bed with your honey, obviously. None of them want that. You've got to wave a flag in their face and you've got to convince them that, that their, their country is threatened and all that sort of thing. And even that doesn't get it. You finally have to use the coercive power of the state. You've got to draft them. And you've got to say, you go in the army or you go to prison or you get shot. Those are your alternatives. So if it was so much in human beings that just want to fight and kill, why must they go through uh, those kind of things? Therefore, I think you have to look at war as something which is a social, the product of social organization. War is not an expression of an individual predisposition. War is the product of a particular and a very elaborate and very technical and complex social organization. And that's what you would have to look at. This idea of just looking at trying to explain social things by something in the individual bosom is, I think, bad sociology. It's bad social science. What you've left out is a whole bunch of intermediary uh, things like social structure, the economy, the class interests of certain people, the culture, and all those other things. I, I'm sorry, you've got to come up to the microphone and, and, and I'll ha be happy to hear you. Or, or say it louder again. Why? Well, not, well, only men don't make wars. Women have been so oppressed in the world that they have not had the opportunities to be in positions of power. And when they have been in positions of power, they make wars. Indira Gandhi made wars. Uh, Golda Meir made wars. Uh, Margaret Thatcher made wars. She sent men off to die and kill, and she was like any other politician. Oh, but that's because they're male. Uh, they're operating in a male thing. Ah, okay. They're operating in a ma macho male psychology. Ah. So then it's not what's between your legs that counts, it's what's between your brains. It's the psychology that you're in. 
That's exactly it. And you've demonstrated my point that even women, when they are put in that psychology and in that social system, and they are fight and they're and they're and they're interested in things like power and re-election and territory and economic gain, even women will act like men. And the reason women haven't been doing that through history is because they have been denied access to power. Obviously, I would have thought you knew the answer to that. Yeah. <laughs> Michael, there are a lot of people in the so-called New Age movement that I think are very progressive and would make, I'm not talking about the fringe, totally self-absorbed, running to channelers all the time, but serious people who are concerned with a lot of the same issues that progressive people on the left, they're progressive in their own ways, but maybe the, the languages that the two speak are a little bit different, and I'd be interested in hearing your critique or analysis of the New Age movement vis-a-vis -vis, uh, progressive thinking political and political action. Well, I think the, uh, uh, I see, I, I don't want to characterize, I don't know if I'm that, <clears throat> uh, what all the dimensions or aspects of New Age movement you have in mind. What specifically do you mean? The green movement, the environmental movement? I think it's excellent. Do you mean, do you mean uh, the mysticism, uh, the idea of defining human beings in a non-domination way vis-a-vis -vis their environment or their world? Do you mean uh, um, well, I transcendence? Think, do you mean transcendence, cosmic consciousness? I think there are people, things? yeah, I think there are people involved in all of those factions that you mentioned who would actually make natural allies with uh, people that you might feel more attuned with and more ideologically inclined to agree with, and yet the two don't really seem to have much of a dialogue going on. And I think what they really want in a lot of ways are, are the same thing. It's well, like, I, there's a liberation involved, and uh, some people are looking for personal liberation, but I think once they get further along in it, they realize it can't be personal, it has to apply to, to the society as a whole. And then vice versa, people who are just looking out to improve society, I think, come to a point where they realize they really have to work on themselves. Also, right. they can't just be you know, insane, Correct. sprouting, spouting uh, right. rhetor rhetor rhetoric. Well, I, I think you've answered your question very well, and I agree with that. <laughs> that uh, that a, a, an individual preoccupation with self-improvement becomes a kind of self-indulgence and a bad politics. Uh, I know people like that who say, how can I try to improve the world until I improve myself? Or how can I hope to, what's the term, uh, rectify or, or, or whatever, the world, uh, oh, I have to really do it with myself. Myself as the greatest inner reality, usually accompanied with a claw-like gesture to the sternum. <laughs> Myself in here, deep. Um, uh, that's a very convenient thing. That means uh, you, what you've done is you've overlooked the fact that yourself is in part a product of all sorts of social relations that are out there. And I think you have a correct strategy, which is looking at yourself, but you do, as you say, after a while, see if those who do see the limitations of that, I mean, uh, you can put it this way. How could you think about doing, looking at yourself when the greenhouse effect's gonna roast you to death, you know? So maybe you gotta do a little something out there too. On the other hand, it's also true with political people that they must pay attention to how they deal with other people and, and how they deal with themselves, and they should, and, and, and so they should, um, um, you know, be cognizant of those things. That's the book, it's, it's a book I plan to write someday, Bob. You may not have known that, but I have a book in my head and even notes in a file on it. It's, it's about four books down the road. That's the problem, the, the books, the other books keep coming in. It'll be the last book I write, I guess, before I head for that great lecture hall in the sky. But the title of it, <laughs> the title of it will be Co Communism and Cosmic Consciousness. And um, I'm, I'm not, I'm not joking, I'm not joking. I really plan to write a book about that subject. It may not get that title because no one will publish it, or, or maybe not, hey, it may be a hot topic by then. But um, uh, most definitely, ultimately, we, we um, you see, I do think though that the human animal is really given to struggle and engagement with the world. Those of us who have, who have gone through periods of removal and meditation, and diet, and rice and veggies only, 
and more meditation and yoga and reading trend books on transcendence. And by the way, I'm one of those. I, I've, I've done that right in the middle of when I was very politically active too, and I took a period off. Um, I found it very useful. I, I still meditate now and then when I, when I think about it. And all. But um, what was I gonna say about that? Those of us who did that. I forgot my train. What happens to our, uh, what, what happens to us is we lose our ability to concentrate on things. That, that's what happens. No, no. Uh, oh, I was gonna make a good point. I forget. Yeah. It's God. Yeah. <laughs> yes, Miss. Um, I feel the lack of a gender relations analysis and your analysis, and so I'm gonna bring it up again, uh, as the other women have. One, one way in which I thought about it while you were talking was that there was no um, acknowledgement that this super patriot or um, number one mentality um, benefits men in, in some ways and hurts women in some other ways and in very serious ways. And I'd like you to respond to that. Well, I agree with you that most definitely super patriotism is a well, you know, it's less and less a purely male domain. I mean, one of the one of the ironic things is that as feminism won certain victories, like the ability to be in the army, they also then share in the not so nice things. As women win win mobility and access to the society, they begin to share in the sins of that society. So you do have women's units now in the Marines, in the Air Force, in the Navy, and in the infantry in the army. Although I guess the army now just had a new policy that women are not going to go into combat. Isn't that the latest rule now? I think they just recently decided that women can get the training, but they will not go into combat. But I was going to say, but it still is predominantly a male domain, and it and it and it uh, preaches virtues that have traditionally been associated with men. However, my impression is that women are in the army to prove that those virtues are not exclusively men, that they too can do a 10-mile hike, that they can climb that rope and go over that, that wooden wall, and they can get through basic training, and they are doing these things. So super patriotism is now expanding its clientele. It's, it's recruiting women into its ranks also. Uh, it victimizes women in the way that I think any conservative thought victimizes women. It victimizes women as workers. It victimizes women as women. I mentioned personal relations. It victimizes women as plaintiffs and, uh, in, in, in law, where the crimes against women are not treated as seriously as, uh, as, as they should be. And those crimes are terrible. The condition of women in this world is, is terrible. I mean, women are being beaten, they're being raped, they're being exploited, they're being used in prostitution. Read Kathleen Barry's book, Female Sexual Slavery. She points out that most prostitution is not voluntary. It is not voluntary. Most prostitution, almost all of it. Maybe there's the, the college girl on the east side who uh, you know, goes to the, the posh apartment and, and works with a nice madam and, and gets some quick money to get herself through graduate school. That's, that's not the other 90% of the prostitutes throughout the world. She gives the case of the Mayo tribesmen who are recruited by the CIA to carry out counter-revolution, and the CIA flies in these prostitutes. And she says, why are you calling them prostitutes? Prostitutes implies voluntary employment. These are girls taken from, young girls, young women, taken from remote villages. Would they volunteer to go to some place they don't even know among these men and, and to be used sexually in this way? They really are sexual slaves. The, uh, the areas where women, uh, uh, female infibulation is used, the, uh, the, the ways women are abused in marriages and battered wives, these are terrible things and these are all part of a very real and very terrible oppression. I'm sorry my talk wasn't about that subject. It's a real subject, and my talk wasn't about it. And, and um, I don't deny that super patriotism has this macho thing. What I was trying to say, and I don't know why you would balk at that, is that that macho thing isn't the cause of imperialism. That imperialism really is carried out by people who have very rational goals and rational gains, and they make a lot of money out of it. They make a lot out of their multi-billion dollar world investments. And imperialism is a way of maintaining global capitalism, and it's a way of maintaining, of maintaining um, that, that class privilege. And I did mention, I did mention uh, 
the problems of sexism, and I also mentioned racism. You could fault me equally, which you haven't done because you're white, maybe, I don't know. You could fault me equally for not showing how super patriotism is a racist, essentially a racist thing. Even though blacks also are getting into the military and they're becoming officers and all that sort of thing. Um, but uh, that's a, those are another, those are two good lectures. You might, might want to deal with that, the relationship of super patriotism to racism and sexism. I thought I did mention both of those problems I very strongly several briefly. times. I, I think but I, I couldn't make a whole analysis of that subject. And by the way, I've been told by some women that I'm not equipped to make an analysis of that subject, that, that's, that I don't have the experience or the sensitivity being a man. And I get damned both ways. Uh, either you can't do it because you're a man, you just you didn't have the vocabulary, you wouldn't know what it's about, uh, and then you're damned if you don't. But I, I would maintain, I was especially interested, you see, in trying to link the relationship of pat super patriotism to the power structure and the class interests of the society. Well, I'm actually interested in hearing your opinion. Um, for. During the Super Bowl, most of us know that more women are abused than any other time during the year, and that is that gives, true. That and that gives, um, you know, that puts a different light on your talking about this patriotism thing. That means some men and all men are benefiting in some way from um, that mentality. And I thought that you might have a few words to say on that. So I don't need to dominate. But if you have more to say about that, I appreciate it. No, I just, uh, if, more, if more women are abused during the Super Bowl period, it's because there is a cultural predisposition to the abuse of women. That's not created by the Super Bowl, it's there. And what the Super Bowl simply does is invite men to drink a lot. More, there are more men drinking like fish during the Super Bowl, and they go home and, uh, did they ever calculate which city is the winning city more abusive or the losing city? Uh, might, be an, might, might be an interesting thing, what? Doesn't matter, both cities. A rotten thing. Yeah. It seems like uh, anybody that looks into it would see that the United States government is one of the most hypocritical when it comes to human rights and sort of obsessing with countries like Nicaragua and Cuba and totally ignoring Chile and Guatemala and Israel, countries like that. I'm wondering if you have a sense as to why it is that the United States government totally ignores the genocide that's going on in Tibet when in fact it's being perpetrated by a communist party, which you'd think would make it an easy target, and yet they've totally ignored that for some 20 years. I'm just wondering if you have any opinions about that. Well, I, I don't know if I would call it genocide. There are certainly abuses, there's certain repression. Genocide really means a systematic extermination of a whole people, and that hasn't gone on. When the Chinese moved into Tibet, which they've always claimed suzentry over, which even the Kuomintang and Chiang Kai-shek claimed is part of China, they found a society that was feudal. They found a society where the monasteries dominated, where the peasants were terribly exploited, where the monasteries owned most of the land, and the peasants slaved away like serfs. They, they affected certain changes in Tibet. They brought, they brought education, they brought housing, they brought, I think, better economic conditions for most of the people of Tibet. They also came down heavy-handedly in certain places. They also, um, they also came down very heavily on, on, the <clears throat> on the Buddhist ruling caste in Tibet. Buddhism in Tibet is not just a religion. It was, the, it was, a, it was a part of the a ruling social organization. That caste ruled in Tibet. It was a theocracy. You wouldn't call the mullahs in Iran just a religion. The mullahs in Iran are getting the gravy of that whole Islamic revolution. They've been getting the payoff. They've been getting the goodies out of that revolution. And they also have political power. They were a ruling class. And that was true. And the Chinese broke the power of that ruling class in Tibet. And what you have now is that a reaction, that ruling class, and maybe also with some popular elements, because people, after all, may be very beholden to their priests, whether it be in Portugal or Spain or Tibet, uh, fighting back. And maybe also with legitimate grievances. There may also be abuses and corruptions and, and, and harsh repressions going on. But I wouldn't call it genocide. I guess the US, hasn't, the US has commented on it, and has, the US press has played it up. But uh, we are now uh, sort of the uh, allies, not allies, but sort of friendly with China, so I guess they haven't been as, as frothing at the mouth, mouth over it as they are in regard to the Sandinistas. 
playing sort of a devil's advocate here, uh, aren't you just as guilty of, as being a uh, super patriot by expounding upon a few ideals like social justice and true democracy and then giving us and telling us that only a true patri patriot can support a certain agenda of political action to that goal? No. Um, <clears throat> well, obviously, it's, a, it's an argument I'm making. It's, it's a partisan argument I'm making. And the argument is to invite people on the left to realize, and a lot, most people on the left already do, uh, but it's okay to talk about something people already realize, okay to flush it out, flesh it out, um, that, that we are the patriots and people um, have known this, all, a lot of people know this for years, that we care enough about our country to go out there and get on the picket lines and protest and do these things. And so I would argue that if you really love your country, then you have to love social justice too. There's no, there's no way, uh, um, there's no way you can have a sincere level. Well, loving social justice is one thing, but going on a partic particular political agenda is another. How do you equate the uh, true patronism, uh, patriotism, which recognizes these ideals and a certain political agenda? Well, that certain, that political agenda, as you call it, is not a sinister thing. It's for the, it's for the operation and the fulfillment of social justice. It's a political agenda that calls for the bettering of the mass of the of working people. It calls for reining in the abusive powers of capitalism, government, it's of stopping imperialism in Central America. That political agenda is part of justice. When Camus made that statement, I, I want to love my country in justice too, Camus was talking about, he made that statement during the time when his country was torturing and killing and murdering people in North Africa, in Algiers. And that's when he made that statement. He was saying, hey, you, you, you're, you're, you're pushing me to the point where I'm having trouble loving my country. If, if this is done in the name of my country and you're telling me to be a true Frenchman, I've got to go along with this stuff, no way. But hey, on the other hand, I'm not ready to give you a monopoly on patriotic franchise. And I still love my country, but I want to love it. And I want to love my country and love justice too. That's what he's saying. <clears throat> Why don't we just have one last question if there is? Okay, one last question. <clears throat> Hi, I get the impression that there is a war going on from the media and they call it the war on drugs and that's to protect the United States, our great country, you know, from this poisoning coming from outside. Now I'm not really advocating drugs. However, mm -hmm. I'm wondering what's your opinion, what's behind this so-called war? Well, the war on drugs is a baloney publicity campaign. There's never been a war on drugs. Um, and uh, the drug situation in this country is a very real and terrible and serious one. Opium, coke, crack, <clears throat> morphine, heroin, all that stuff is pouring into this country like it never did before, and it's very functional. It's keeping the black urban and Latino urban proletariat, which uh, 20 years ago was rising up with the young lords and black panthers and organizing and talking about revolution and off the pigs and all that. It's keeping them doped up and quiet in those communities. That's why you have conservatives being very sanguine and very languid about it. William Buckley writes a column and says, oh, it's not such a big problem, and it really uh, is, can't be solved. It's not such a big problem. Problem, but in fact, it's too big to be solved. Uh, it'll always go on, and that's that. And I thought, isn't that remarkable? Here's these conservatives who every other day in the week rail about the corruption and degeneracy of our moral fiber and the social fabric of America, and yet taking an oddly languid view. And I could see why, because they would have, as a right-wing, if I were a right-wing columnist, I'd have more serious things to worry about as to whether the black urban proletariat, after we've cut human entitlements and human services in the inner city by some 30 and 40 percent, why they not would they rise up and riot and all that? They're not rising up and rioting because they're too busy shooting themselves up and shooting each other up over turf fights and drug distribution stuff. That's exactly what the British did in China in the last century. They brought opium in from India into China and turned that nation into dope heads to keep those people in place. And, so, and, and a product produced in one country got sold in the other. Those Chinese opium dens were not Chinese. That wasn't part of Chinese culture.
culture. You always see those pictures of, of them, uh, those old Fu Manchu movies, the opium dens. That, that was a British invention. The British brought that in. And the opium wars were fought because the Chinese wanted to keep that stuff out because it was destroying their people. And you go to black communities today and you'll talk to the minister and ask him, we should legalize drugs, shouldn't we? You'll hear from those guys about legalizing drugs. The hell they want to legalize it. They want that stuff out because it's destroying their homes, their communities, their children, their families, and they are desperate about it. And it's not only black communities, it's spreading around into white communities. I, I was up in Blue Mountain Lake in upper New York. I mean, this is something off of Norman Rockwell uh, Saturday evening post painting, you know, with the church steeple and the little general store and all that. They got a drug problem in their high school. All sorts of funny things coming in there. Um, so, so it's spreading out and you can't contain it. There could be a drug war in this country. We could have a war on drugs and it never has been fought and there never has been one. All there's been is this phony publicity promotional thing by Ronald Reagan uh, who at the same time cuts the Coast Guard and all that. But we know where the drugs come from. We know the routes that the Afghan freedom fighters have been supplying us. And in fact, I just saw that in the paper the other day is that is, as they move in and the Kabul government retreats, the opium supply will increase. That's your Afghan freedom fighters who are fighting Soviet aggression. They're fighting to keep their opium markets open and to keep their women and children and slavery. That's what they're fighting for in this feudal landlord system. Uh, that's the, they know where that stuff comes from. They know where it comes from out of Thailand. They know where it goes into Sicily. They know the Inzarelli family and the Spatola families monopolize the five uh, heroin processing factories in Sicily. They know the boats it goes on and to the Dominican Republic. They know the airstrips in Costa Rica where the stuff came out of. They know the places in Colombia and Bolivia. They know where it lands in the U.S. They know that stuff. Don't tell me this country is too big. Dick Gregory was right about that. And he said, 500 planes a year come in with the stuff. They can't stop it because it's too big. He said, can you imagine if 500 planes full of Russian spies were coming in every year? Would they be able to stop it? <laughs> and And when Ramon, Ramon Rodriguez was, uh, was appeared before the Curry Committee, they said to him, what are you doing? He said, I'm doing 43 years in prison for laundering drug money. An amount of how much? About $2 million a week. $2 million a week. Can you imagine the size of this guy's suitcases? And, and he said, to where? Besides Panama. He said, to the top, to top, not to the top, but to top elected officials and military personnel in Colombia, Ecuador, Bolivia, um, Costa Rica, Guatemala, El Salvador, Mexico, all over. And, 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 uh, and, and one of the other senators said, how did you get through customs and all that? And he said, really, Senator? You know, I mean, <laughs> you know, all doors open to you when you're carrying two million bucks in your pocket. Well, uh, to, you see, to think these things are just mysterious problems is to pretend to have to be dumber than we really are. Uh, I mean, I know about those things. The CIA knows about those things. All what they would need is from the White House is an order to crack down on it, to, to cooperate with Interpol and, and international police and crack down and smash that thing. But they're not doing that. In fact, we now know there are plenty of CIA operatives that are in on it. They were taking it out of Vietnam and Indochina, and they're taking it out of Central America, and they're using it to fund the Contra War. That's a profoundly immoral thing. Um, and, um, and I say good night to you all. Thank you for being such a very nice audience. Thank you very much, Michael Parenti, and thank you all for coming this evening. Copies of Michael's talk will be available at KGNU uh, tomorrow morning. You can come by the station or you can give us a call. And uh, there are tapes of other